Thank you, friends. Good afternoon. If you will kindly please excuse me, uh, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, with all the very important people around. I hope you allow me to dispense with the formal greetings of the specific dignitaries here. Uh, I am afraid I will be charged with an equal protection. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, it is a pleasure for me to be with you. I feel very much attuned with actually the objectives of your summit. This is not something that is foreign to me. As early as uh, in my 30s, I had already been engaged in anti-corruption initiatives. So that when I received the invitation from Chairman Ramon del Rosario, I did not hesitate to say yes, to make sure that I do not forfeit this opportunity to be with you, and to assure everyone that the judiciary is with you all the way. So with this pledge, with this commitment, allow me to convey the gratitude of the judiciary because I see this not as any threat on our independence, not as you impinging on our functions, but rather you sharing our common concern that justice indeed be actualized in this country. I have been, this is just my fourth day in office, fourth week in office, and uh, I have uh, faced since day one a very difficult, the very difficult task of trying to rationalize our budget presentation and seeking to convince the two political branches of government that we deserve at this point in time all the support that they can give us. So I want to impress on you how I envision my role to be. From day one, after my appointment, after I was sworn in, I immediately set to work in the afternoon after coming from Malacanang. So I spent the weekend going over all the urgent matters that needed attending to. That is why the topic is we are moving forward, we are moving fast, but we are moving on solid ground. This is to assure you that under my leadership, you will see 18 years of judicial stability. <laughs> the background that I want to relate to you is the fact that the judiciary occupies but one part in a very complex network of organizations with interlocking rules and interlocking administrative supervision. This is the kind of network that basically captures for us what is called the justice system. If you can look at this, much of the issues of enforcement, investigation, prosecution, even quasi-judicial adjudication are under the administrative supervision of the executive department and in the criminal justice system, the penalty and rehabilitation of offenders still form part of the executive department. We have little to do with how these functions are discharged except when in the exercise of our judicial review powers. So that when you talk about case delay, for example, it is important to find out where the responsibility lies, at whose door uh, it, uh, it, accountability has to be exacted. So while I am head of the Justice Sector Coordinating Committee, a larger part of the work really belongs to the Executive Department. So in a sense, we have to have mutually reinforcing systems because the judiciary is only accountable really for the integrated judicial system. And this is what you call as the formal court systems. We also have powers over quasi-judicial agencies, but only in a limited extent with respect to practice and procedure where we can prescribe what the extent that they can, uh, um, to the extent that we can inter intervene 
in the formulation of the rules. But even quasi-judicial agencies are not under the judiciary's supervision. So to think that we occupy a key role is not really inaccurate. But that key role is incomplete. We need our partners to help us and support us all the way. Now, despite reforms, and we have had two decades of reforms in the judiciary. So if we are talking of the past two decades, these are the six phases that we had undergone. First is after the 1986 EDSA revolution, we tried to create the constitutional standards for an effective justice system. So while the tradition of the past was there, it was really a remaking of a judiciary in a working democracy. So the initial rules were put up, largely a takeoff from what was in the past, but effectively on the bedrock of democratic accountability. After that, in the 1990s, we saw strengthening of human and institutional capabilities to respond to increasing workload. This is in tandem with the observed increase in the population of the country. So there were episodic initiatives, there were singular initiatives that were uh, done by the court, but obviously a systematic overhaul was not yet in the works. Then in the third phase, and this is where I had occasion as a young law professor to be involved in, there were preliminary diagnostics in economic development and the justice system that was conducted with the help of the UNDP to find out if the judiciary was ripe for large-scale judicial reform initiatives that could be funded even by the in, in local and do international donor community. So we went through the blueprint for judicial reform, which was created in 1999, and which was also, in a certain sense, the takeoff for the large-scale David Watch action program for judicial reform from 2001 to 2006. So this is a more or less a five and a half year program. Justice, Chief Justice Panganiban took over in 2005 and he emphasized liberty and prosperity. After him, of course, the Puno Court made strides in the issuance of the Ritz of Amparo, Habeas Data, and the Ritz of Kalikasan. There is, therefore, this continuing impetus, and I don't think it will ever stop. We are on the movement for reform. But the question is, are we reforming fast enough and effectively enough? The question as to whether we are committed to reform is not even something that needs to be asked at this point. We are committed. We are committed. But the question is, can we succeed? How soon? How effectively? How deeply? Perhaps it is... There is something to be said about having a chief justice sit for a long time to oversee an overhaul of the justice system that will be required in order to ensure that the reforms are deep, they will be institutionalized, they will be stable, they will be fast, and they will be address both systemic issues and they will be systematically implemented. So it gives us all thought on what can be done in 18 years' time, and I think the consensus will be a lot. So how do I see now the job that is before me? I see that despite these reforms, there have been major shortcomings that have not yet been addressed. And the one thing that you have always been repeatedly citing is the general perception that there is case congestion and there is delay. I know that for the business and investor community, the time value of money is very important. And I understand, and I understand fully, that you must have an understanding of the parameters for decision making. What are the risks? that will be involved in making a decision that cannot be implemented if it only hangs in the court for X number of years. We will address this. Now, however, to allow you to have a bird's eye view of 
how large our problems are. I, as I told the judges, I am not a chief justice that doesn't like to confront problems. I like to confront problems hand, head on. I am a very hands-on person, and I've told the judges to come to me immediately with their problems. And this is the so, so, size of the problems that are before us. This is just one chart. So you can see, actually, that from 2004 to 2011, from the absolute number of dependency of cases, there has been an actual decline. But I think that from any point of view, 600,000 ca cases and more is still not acceptable. In other words, this is the reality. It is not an acceptable piece of data that is before us. It has shown improvement, but it has not shown improvements enough to assure us that the gap between those cases that are pending and the rate of disposition will work so that I can assure you that in X number of years, we can basically have a situation of a zero backlog system. I still have to do the mathematics on this point because I have begun to understand that the data that we have still need discrete di differentiation. And I was hoping that I can come back to you after a number of months to, find, to tell you that we are ready for the metrics and performance based uh, and the metrics based performance evaluation. But you would need to give me time because uh, introducing a culture of metrics based performance evaluation is not really that strong a culture in the judiciary. There has to be a reworking of that culture where we are uh, amendable to opening ourselves to identifying key result areas that we will announce to the public and we will be accountable for meeting those key result areas. So how long we can address this, I am not prepared to say when we will be able to achieve for you a livable pendency rate or congestion. The next slide will show you a pie chart defining for us what is still missing in our data gap as you can see, even though we have imperatives already from statutes that, uh, especially with respect to criminal cases, we need to dispose of them soon. You basically don't have cases that can be disposed of within a year from the time of filing. This is just a crude and general aging of cases that we are looking at. And I have, for example, come to, of, of course, believe that when it comes to, when we have cases that are, have been pending in courts for 10 years of mo or more at the rate of 3%, though, although that is not too bad, still that data should be actually zero. Okay, so I will try to find out the mix of the pie, the distribution of the pie chart that is acceptable in order for people not to feel that justice here in the Philippines is being horribly denied because of the delay of the moment from the moment that they have been filed until their final resolution. As you may have probably heard from the newspaper and media accounts, other media accounts, we have just introduced the judicial affidavit rule. And we hope that with the introduction of the judicial affidavit rule, which will start to be implemented in January of 2013, we hope to cut litigation time by 50% because that will already allow for direct testimonies which take up, as I said, 50% of litigation time to be submitted in simple affidavit forms. So that is a revolutionary step that we have taken. Uh, there are many questions about its implementation, but we are hopeful about its success. Of course, there are many more reform measures. You have already the small claims court. You have mediation. You have... Uh, judicially referred uh, dispute resolution. And these are all being pushed in tandem. And uh, I'm just not at liberty right now to unveil to you this afternoon the package of reform measures that are still going to be unloaded in the next few months. But uh, our judges seem to be energized by the thought that we are really doing our level best to help them cope with the inordinately heavy caseloads that they are bearing. 
Many of, judge, of our judges really are well-meaning and are hardworking. It is just that the system is really in a terrible fix, as you can see. We have not really had enough metrics performance. We have not yet really had the kind of modern streamlining processes that are very popular and easy and comes as a matter of course to sophisticated businesses such as those that you operate. I hope to introduce such systems in the judiciary. Despite these reforms, there are still major shortcomings that persist. We have integrity issues, and I don't have to explain this. We have serious inefficiencies in operations, and I'm not ashamed as the CEO of the judiciary to admit this. We have competence or competency issues, and we have issues on public trust and confidence. And we have identified ways by which all of these problems, nagging problems, including case congestions and delay, can be addressed. And why do these problems persist? From my reading, initial reading, of uh, what has happened for the past 20 years, the diagnostics that were applied and the result of those diagnostics, we have basically a problem both in our planning process, in our streamlining process, in our implementation process, in our monitoring process. Basically, you, you have limited implementation capabilities. If you are looking at the 2,000 plus judge core, we are not really trained to be good managers. I'm not saying we're good. We're very good at what we do. But we did not receive the specialized training in management that most of you have. Now, much of the work given to judges right now are administrative and managerial in nature. They are not adjudicatory. So the long-term view is to unload that from the judges and give the tasks more to either really professional managers and those who are in the staff will be increasingly trained in management so that you give the work to those who can make the work happen. You also have basically inadequate investment in increasing not only physical capacities but also human capacities. So we are going to look not only at the investment infrastructure spending of the court, the buildings, the technological capabilities, but I'm going to increasingly look at how much we are spending for upgrading human capabilities in the judiciary. Then you basically have a broken down system of accountability. In many spots, you don't have basically a system of monitoring and timely calling a slippages in performance. So usually, we are just used to coming out with decisions, but in terms of the quality, how fast, when these decisions are come out, in terms of accountability for the uh, records and the finances and the facilities of the court, that st system still has to be built up in many places, refurbished in others, and completely overhauled in the so really sore spots of the administrative and operations part of uh, the of the judiciary, and basically this basically results in a weak institution that cannot deliver service well. And if it is a weak institution with a poor accountability system, you basically have a system that can be corrupted. Although we can, we, I'm calling on judges right now to be modern day living heroes because I see them really as modern day living heroes and I've seen so many of them sacrifice their personal and family lives and even fortunes to serve the judiciary and the people. Still, it must be a systematic institutionalized system of accountability that does not just rely on heroic and isolated acts of sacrifice, but rather that efficiency and honesty is the norm and the reverse is a rarity. So what do I wish to accomplish? What do I see for the future and what are the goals that I wish to uh, achieve? One that is a professionalized judiciary. When I talk about a professionalized judiciary, I'm not talking only about the judges per se who handle adjudicatory functions, but I'm also talking about the technical staff and the administrative and general services staff that support these judges. 
My idea is that over the long term, we can create a professional, really an, a really excellent core of civil servants, and the entry to which will recognize their distinct, uh, the distinct categories of judges, technical personnel, and then administrative and general services where you don't ask judges to do something they are not supposed to be competent in, and neither do you ask admin and general services to be have anything to do with adjudication. There will be streamlining and functions definition of roles and competitive entry and hopefully examinations to each particular strand in the three-pronged judiciary that I see. Some law schools are even willing to introduce courses even at the law school level, to prepare young people to envision a life in the judiciary. In other East Asian countries, this is already the, the case that those who want to enter the judiciary can start young. So we are going to look at it, but if you are going to look at it, it has to be consist of a 10-year human resource development plan for the professionalizing of the core and eventually the institutionalization of these professional systems will take the rest of the 18 years. So a professionalized judiciary. Then I'm looking at the centralized operations. I had already given instructions that we are to revive the regional court administration offices. We are going to start with first three regional court administration uh, in regions three, uh, seven and 11. And uh, uh, we are going to try to download as on a modular basis the kind of functions that we need to unload. We will start with procurement and slowly as the system is able to level up, then we unload also the accounting system, etc. But in tandem with this, I have also asked that we look at the existing efficiency structures that are already be in place. Although we were going to uh, we are going to unload some of the procurement functions, we are also going to not forget that there is already an electronic procurement service that is already being provided by the government. And we are going to slowly move into electronic procurement so that we can get the savings and efficiency that have already been started in the other branches of government. Then we, have, we are going to go to the congested courts and reduce delays. Now, in order to achieve these over the long term, we have to have four pillars for the, of the judicial reform agenda. First is instituting integrity and restoring public trust and credibility. That's a major job, and I have a lot of communication personal communication work in this sphere, and I will elucidate on that in a later slide. Second will be to ensure the predictability, rationality, speed, and responsiveness of judicial actions. When I was talking about judicial stability for 18 years, basically this is what I hope that you will see. When you're a businessman, you will understand that our decisions are always rational, they are predictable, they are done in due, but not undue speed, and it responds to the problem that is really at hand. For this purpose, I, I will uh, well, give you more details later. C will be improving systems and infrastructure, and D will be developing efficient and effective human resources. Now, to go to the first pillar, instituting integrity, restoring public trust and credibility. I am thinking that we should create an internal affairs office where you have specialists that he will really do the monitoring and the insurance that the metrics and the standards are being performed by our judges and our non-judge personnel. Then we will have to strengthen our internal control system and audit. We basically have to modernize and make sure that we are at time with the best. Then we have to remove resource dependency of regional appellate and lower courts on local government units. Many local government units continue to support our judges, and their support is actually substantial. We have to look, look at the way of bridging the support that they are presently uh, giving and finding a way to fill the gap. 
as well as private donors of personal benefits. I'm not talking about direct bribery here. I'm talking about contributions in terms of other kinds of benefits. And of course, we have to have a public information and education program to convince everyone to return back and remember the classical view of the judge, the classical view of the judge, who is a public servant specially removed from the passing fashions of the day and who is removed from the material distractions of an otherwise very active civilian life. In a certain sense, we have to understand that we, those who join the judiciary are not there for the money, are not there to create great wealth for themselves, but they enter the judiciary simply because they want to be part of a noble calling and they want to serve in the competence that God has given them. And then I have to have ensuring transparency and adopt best practices in fund management, and I will have to establish modeling practices. There are so many models in the judiciary right now. We can pick on outstanding judges left and right, and I will ensure that the reward system for these judges will be there. Now for my second pillar, ensuring predictability, rationality, speed, and responsiveness of judicial actions. We have to establish a database of decisions to enable detection of conflicting court decisions. We have to ha establish templates of court actions by lower court judges. We have to support judiciary referred mediation of private business and contract disputes. We have to strengthen and professionalize a core of judiciary accepted mediators. And I want to create sensitivity tests to find out what cases we need to prioritize to determine those that need immediate action by the court. The third pillar, improving systems and infrastructure. You have to implement a sustainable court infrastructure program. We have to create a publicly accessible case monitoring system. We have to modernize budget and expenditures planning and monitoring and install modern financial management systems. We want to outsource non-core functions. We want to devolve admin actions to the lowest feasible responsible level. We have to institute international best practices, including certification systems for our critical process flows. And we will go E and we will go green in a big way. For D, development of efficient and effective human resources. We want to rationalize the creation of courts and the deployment of judges. We have to create an 18-year HR development program with professional career tracks for the three-pronged track that I have seen. And we have to rationalize compensation and benefit systems that, look, that looks at judges and personal needs from a holistic viewpoint. Now, that's a... The big, that's a very big plate that's before <laughs> us. <laughs> now, okay, this is how you can help. Okay, the first is very, this is a very hard-nosed proposition. It does not help for you to bribe magistrates and court employees. And to that extent, I'm very grateful for your pledge. And I want to believe that you are 100% committed to this pledge despite the possible short-term adverse repercussions to your cases. If we are start with the basis of good faith, and you have the assurance of good faith on the part of judi the judiciary, I think we can go a long way. There's nothing that is really impossible for us to achieve. So I want you also to provide a feedback mechanism on the conduct of the courts, on integrity issues, and on delays. Just kindly, I will request, do not go on a generalized condemnation, because after I had shown you the first substantive slide, you can understand now that the entire system is really a network of accountabilities, and we are responsible only for a part. While we will try to co coordinate closely with other justice sectors, you also have to give accountability, only uh, make accountability uh, only from where it is true. And then I will ask you to be partners in outsourcing of some non-core judicial functions. Right now, I'm talking about IT systems. I'm, I'm looking at how the infra program can be rolled off immediately without us having to monitor whether we are constructing correctly, etc. because 
who of us have really had experiences in constructing halls of justice. You have already made many advances. We can just be a beneficiary of the advances you've made if you will just share with us the best practices and how we can achieve in the speediest possible time how to get from point A to point B. I think you are ready to give us those ideas. Now, on the other hand, aside from the commitment of this leadership to see this program through, I know that you had you ask personal pledges from people. Now, I don't want to make a new pledge because actually I have been pledging for a long time. What I will do is to repeat for you what I said twice in a public, before a public audience in Ateneo de Davao University when I was asked to speak on the Ateneo as a public servant and at the Ateneo de Manila University, when I was speak, I was asked to speak on Agne Ignatian spirituality. So I hope you will not begrudge me, because this is something very important to me. The Constitution recognizes freedom of belief. And you can understand that when I choose a certain direction, what I will, I'm actually engaging on and holding on really is a value proposition. You cannot deny success. You do not destroy what works. And what works for me is the core of my personal beliefs. So if my personal beliefs is something that is beyond the material and the socially acceptable, that is, I guess, the freedom that I, as any other human being, has. So I have made a pledge. I have not really made a pledge. I just announced to the world seven rules that I, as Associate Justice, I never thought that I would be Chief Justice when I made this. <laughs> when I delivered this personally at the Ateneo de Manila Univers de Davao University, and when I was already a nominee for the Chief Justiceship at the Ateneo de Manila University. And these are seven rules that I live by as Associate Justice, and I can continue to live by, and I will pledge to you before the public that those rules. First, I will not put myself in a situation where I cannot judge rightly. In other words, I will take an active hand in ensuring I do not put myself in a conflict of interest situation. So when I, you see me regretfully declining your invitations to, to join this social club or to join this network, it is not because I dislike any of you. In fact, I would want human company as any other normal human being. But I must be careful to be perceived, not to be unduly harming my ability to judge rightly by putting myself in a conflict of interest situation. So when I said before the Atene de Davao crowd that I actually had, from a, the day of my appointment, adopted a life of a semi-recluse, I wasn't joking. Of course, now I have more public commitments. I need to speak to a larger audience. But when it comes to social and financial engagements, you will find me very, very shy. Because I have to do this in order that you can continue believing in us. My second rule is that I will deliberately live a modest life. It is not maybe a question of whether I can afford it or not. Of course, I cannot afford many of the things you can afford being a public servant, but that, that's not the point. The point is it is a deliberate plan to live a modest life so that not only can I say that I am not corrupt, but people can believe that I cannot be corrupted. So I have to choose a lifestyle, and this is the lifestyle I choose. Second, a third rather, I will work in a way that my mind and soul is evident in my work. You must believe that the person speaking before you is the person that you see writing her decision and the person who will you, you will encounter in everyday life. It is a statement of the very person of the Chief Justice when she is making a position on anything. And you will be, see it because when I pour myself into my work, I will try to achieve the highest level of excellence so that you will believe that even if I am mistaken, even if I am mistaken, and I will be mistaken, I am sure, you cannot doubt the best of faith that accompanied that decision. You cannot, dis you cannot doubt the kind of effort I have poured in. Fourth, 
I will be truthful and will seek to build a reputation for being truthful. And in a certain sense, therefore, I have to basically be in a, sta in a situation where uh, I am opening myself to, to I, 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 I do not want to play games with any of you. And I want to believe, you to believe that when I say I will do this and this is my position, it is because I believe in it. And it's not because that I have to strategize or play games with you. What for? I don't see the point of us playing games with anyone. I don't see us hedging on each other's positions. Fifth, the test of my heart that I will apply is, if it no longer hurts for me to see injustice being done, then I do not deserve to stay a day longer in the Supreme Court. Precisely, I was chosen because I have to have a heart for justice. And when I see that injustice still continues, if that heart no longer cares, if that heart is already so jaded, then I have no business staying a minute longer. Fifth, a sixth rather, my family must always commit this, themselves to keeping my reputation intact and my integrity. They know that they cannot ask from me anything that is improper. They know that they cannot take advantage of me as Chief, Chief Justice. They know in a certain sense that they are going to deprive themselves of many of the privilege that ordinarily the powerful have. But this is a charge that my family and I have committed to, and this is a charge that we will maintain for, the, for all these 18 years. And this is already my belief, and this is very personal for me, and I ask you for, for you to look at the value proposition that has actually energi energized and undergird my life. I can follow these rules only because I believe in a God who can do, this impossible, do the impossible. And I believe in his grace, and because I believe in that, therefore nothing is impossible, and that is the reason I come to you before in full confidence that we will succeed. So, with that, I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chief Justice Sereno. Unfortunately, the Chief Justice has requested to leave the ballroom and will be unable to take questions from the floor. Let us give her a round of applause once again, please. I would just like to acknowledge some of the questions that were sent. Uh, maybe these can be forwarded to her staff and she can reply to them. Before I introduce um, our next speaker for the closing remarks, we are glad to announce the pilot testing of Integrity Initiative's anonymous reporting system. 
Surveys show that the use of an anonymous whistleblowing reporting system is one of the most effective ways of detecting fraud and corruption. The Integrity Initiative has tapped the proactive 